Welcome to the lecture in Approximation Algorithms. Today we're going to talk about greedy algorithms and local search. My name is Rasmus Pei. Today we're going to look at four case studies exemplifying greedy approaches and local search. Scheduling overdue jobs, the case center problem. Scheduling jobs in parallel. And finally, the metric traveling salesperson problem. Three of these will exemplify greedy and the last one, local search. Let's define the problem of scheduling overdue jobs. The input consists of n jobs. Job i takes time pi to complete. So this is job one, two, and three. Job i has a release time ri, which is the earliest time it can start. This is not negative. And finally, di is the amount of time left for job i. di is less than or equal to zero because the, all the jobs are overdue. So we need to find a time to schedule each job. And these should be non-overlapping. So for example, we could do like this. And we would get a cost of C3 minus D3, where C3 is the completion time of job 3. So the objective that we want to optimize is to create a schedule with no overlapping jobs that minimizes the maximum lateness. So that is, minimizes the maximum over i of ci minus di, where ci is the completion time of job number i. There's a natural greedy heuristic that we can employ. At time t, we consider all the unscheduled jobs that have release time greater than or equal to t and schedule the one with the earliest due time di. So for example, suppose these are the jobs, and this is time zero, and we have initially allocated each job at its release time. Of course, this is an overlapping schedule, so this is not yet valid. So we can move these uh, back and forth. So what we do is that we look at the release times, and suppose that R1 and R3 are both due, then we take R3 first, because it has the earliest uh, due date, then we schedule R1 because it's, uh, it has the due date which is later, and finally R2. The cost in this case becomes the time that R2 is finished uh, minus D2. So notice here that because the jobs are running without any idle time, we can express the time where job 2 finishes as the starting time for job 3, which is the time where we started processing the jobs, plus the sum of the processing times for P1, P2, and P3. So this is the ending time of job 2, from which we subtract D2. Before moving on with the analysis, I'd like you to pause and think. Try to find an input W with two jobs where Greedy's schedule has cost at least 1.99 times the optimal. Let's consider the analysis of the greedy algorithm. Consider the last job scheduled. Let's say job j, it stops at time cj. So when does it start? Well, obviously at time cj minus the processing time pj. Maybe this is equal to rj. But in general, it could be that there was some other job that was running at time rj. In that case, this other job, let's say you call it j prime, stopped at cj prime and started at cj prime minus its processing time. And in general, that could be like a sequence of jobs where each one was waiting for the former one to continue. But at some point, there's going to be a job that actually started without any running job. And that job had to start at its, its release time. So let's call this job a uh, set of jobs S. Then we can write cj as the minimum release time in this set plus the sum of all the processing times in S. So the cost of greedy, in other words, is cj minus dj, which we can express as using this formula. So let's move this a little bit. So now we would like to upper bound this cost. So first consider the two first terms. 
so the minimum of the RJ's release times, plus the sum of all the processing times. I claim that this is less than or equal to the completion time for any schedule. In particular, this is less than or equal to opt. Similarly, minus dj is less than or equal to opt. And in total, this is less than two times opt. So for any valid schedule in the set of jobs, there's going to be s of jobs, there's going to be one that finishes last. And there's no way that we can schedule the jobs in a non-overlapping way, in such a way that it completes earlier than the earliest release time plus the sum of the durations of the jobs. Similarly, even if we complete all the jobs by time zero, we are going to get a cost that is at least minus dj for every j. And by what we saw before, the constant 2 is tight. In the case center problem, we are given a set of points p and we want to cover it with k disks of radius r where r is as small as possible. The center of each disk should be a point in p. So for example, in this example, with k equals to 3, we could consider these three centers. We need to define the distance from a point x to a point set s. It's defined as the minimum distance from x to y where y ranges over the points in s. With this definition, the objective of the k-center problem is to choose a set s, which is a subset of p, such that s has k points, and the maximum distance from x to s is minimized where x ranges over the points in p. A natural greedy algorithm for the k-center problem consists of building the set s point by point. We start with s equal to the empty set and add at each step a point x that is responsible for maximizing the distance to s. So in other words, in each step we add the point x such that the distance from x to the current where s is maximized. And we repeat this until we have a set of size k. So in the example, initially all the distances are infinity, so we can start with any point. So let's choose the one shown here in red. The next one we choose is the one furthest away from the point in red. And finally, we are going to choose the point at the bottom, which is the one that is furthest away from the two points that we already chose. And we can draw uh, disks of radius that is sufficient to capture all the points, and that gives the, the greedy solution. At this point, I want you to pause and think. I want you to argue that greedy can sometimes return a case center that is two times the radius of the optimal case center solution. Let's analyze the performance of the greedy algorithm for k-center. Let's consider an arbitrary optimal solution. Of course, we don't know what that is, but we can imagine it, and we can try to compare the cost of the greedy solution to it. So the optimal solution will consist of k-centers, and disks of radius r around each center that contain all points. There are two cases. First of all, if greedy selects a point from each cluster, I claim that we are done. Why is that? Well, no matter what we choose, from each cluster the maximum distance within a cluster is at most 2r. So in particular, uh, every point is within 2r of one of the points selected. The other case, is that greedy does not select a point from each cluster. So there must be some cluster from which greedy selects at least two points. Let's suppose the two points are chosen in this cluster as part of the greedy algorithm. What does that mean? It means that two points are chosen that have distance at most 2r, which means that all the points in P must have distance at most 2r 
to a point in this, and we are done. We next consider the problem of scheduling jobs in parallel. The input consists of a number of jobs, let's say n jobs, that have different processing times p1 through pn, and we need to allocate these jobs to m machines. So for example, we could allocate the jobs like this, and that would give a certain make span, which is the maximum processing time for any machine. The objective is to allocate jobs to machines to minimize the maximum make span. So the local search approach to solving this problem is to start with any feasible solution. For example, assign all, all jobs to one machine. Then we repeat a local change, in this case move one job to another machine in order to improve make span until it's no longer possible to improve by making a local change. Let's consider an example. Suppose we have a configuration of jobs in the local search like this. Then it's possible to move one job, the first job from machine one, to the last machine, which will reduce the make span. The local search does these kind of changes until it terminates. Now it's time to pause and think. I wanted to show that local search may not necessarily find the optimal solution. How large a gap can you guess? Let us analyze the local search algorithm. Let C star be the cost of an optimal schedule. It's easy to see that C star cannot be too small. In particular, it has to be at least the average cost over all m machines, the sum of all the pi's divided by m, simply because the worst case cannot be smaller than the average. Now suppose that the local search returns a solution of cost more than two times C star. So we have the m machines, we have the average cost, and C star, which is greater than or equal to the average cost. There has to be at least one machine, for example m1, where the cost is less than average. Let's suppose that the largest M make span is in machine MM. The last job schedule on MM needs to have started before the average cost. Why is that? Well, that's because otherwise the local search method would have moved it. Also, the last job needs to have cost or length, at least C star. Why is that? Well, we assumed that the local search returned a solution of cost at least 2 C star, and the last job started before times C star. So let's denote the length of the last job by Pj. What can we say about the make span? Well, it is at most equal to the start time of job j plus the processing time pj. The start time is at most the average uh, processing time by the local search property plus pj, and both of these are upper bounded by c star. So in total, it's at most 2 c star. The final problem we're going to look at today is the metric traveling salesperson problem. We're given a point set p and a metric on these points. Um, let's call the distance from point i to point j c i j and the goal is to find the shortest tour of all the points so something like this like a closed tour so we want to minimize the sum of all the edges in the tour of c i j there are two observations we can make first one is that a tour includes a spanning tree so we can simply omit one point or one edge from the tour and we get a very special spanning tree, it's a path, in fact. The second observation is, at least if the number of points is even, a tour is going to consist of two matchings on the points. So let's, uh, let's color the edges. So all the red edges here make up a matching and all the yellow edges make up a matching. 
So this means that an optimal tour has weight at least two times the weight of a minimum weight matching. And also an optimal tour has weight at least the minimum weight of a spanning tree. So if we could somehow add a minimum weight matching and a spanning tree, it, we would get a three half approximation. This is the idea behind Christophides algorithm, which was described the first time in 1976. It consists of two phases. In the first phase, we compute a minimum spanning tree T of the graph. In the second step, we look at the odd degree vertices in the minimum spanning tree, so the leaves and all internal nodes that have odd degree, and compute a minimum weight matching on those. So let's call that M. So for example, the minimum spanning tree could look something like this. And let's uh, mark the odd degree nodes in orange. So it consists of some leaves and some internal nodes and consider a minimum weight matching on it. So for example, it might consist of these edges. So note here that there might be parallel edges that exist both in the matching and in the minimum spanning tree. So now I claim that we can use these edges to construct a tour. And the tour will have weight that is bounded by the weight of the minimum spanning tree and the weight of the matching. So how do we do this? Well, we use a greedy approach. So we start anywhere and we just choose edges that we haven't used yet. And I claim that this process is never going to get stuck. So there's always going to be a choice we can make until we get back to where we started. In this case, we are done now, but in general, it might be that we need to do this several times to form several tours, which we can then link together. However, we might have visited some nodes several times, but that's no problem because we can make shortcuts. So whenever there's a node that we visit twice, we actually get a better solution by the triangle inequality by going directly to the next node that we haven't visited. So introducing these shortcuts, and this is where we use that we have a metric, uh, we get a tour that visits each node exactly once. Finally, we need to bound the cost of the tour. It's bounded by the cost of the minimum spanning tree, whose edges we have included plus the weight of the maximum matching. By the argument on the previous slide, the former is bounded by the optimal tour weight, and the latter is bounded by one half times the optimal tour length. This was the best known until very recently, but in 2020, Carlin, Klein, and Garan showed that it's possible to improve the approximation factor of three halves. So specifically, they get an approximation factor which is smaller than three half by some epsilon, which is greater than 10 to the minus 36. So a tiny improvement, but it shows that three half is not the best.